So this presentation is about um, searching for phones on the internet, what voice over IP is available on the internet, um, because usually I get, hey, is, isn't voice over IP only on the internal network? And I hope that this proves otherwise. I'll start bit by introducing myself. I'm from Malta, Malta. That's a very small island. And I'm probably the only penetration tester there. <laughs> and security researcher. Uh, author of Subvicious and Vibe Pack, which is a commercial set of tools to test for voice over IP security issues. Web scanner, which is a software as a service. Um, basically, you give it the IP address of your PBX, which might be public facing on the internet, and it sends you back a, a report. And my research is not just about voice over IP, but sometimes uh, I do a lot of research when it comes to web application security, web application firewalls, and web browser security and various different topics. And that's enable security. I run enable security. So we'll be talking about, we, I'll be introducing some basic protocols for those who are not familiar with SIP. Um, we'll show how the internet is full of voice over IP devices. I'll be talking about some ideas when it comes to fingerprinting these devices, because not all devices uh, tell you what, um, what they are running. Some talk about some strange behavior, a honeypot to monitor what others are doing, and we'll talk about briefly about what the cybercrime uh, seems to be doing when it comes to voice over IP. So right now, I'm, my tools are supporting the first two protocols, and the rest, as they say, is works in progress. I'll be talking about SIP here most of the times. Um, SIP, they, some, some people tell you it's, it looks exactly like HTTP, and, and it actually does. In fact, if you were to use a library which parses HTTP messages, it would probably make sense out of SIP messages as well, because it has the same format, basically. Um, and there's some ideas taken from the message format, for which we use for email. So you have from and to headers as well. Uh, but it's quite different from HTTP. In HTTP, you have the client-server model. Um, it's always like that. But in SIP, you you might have a request which is being sent by the SIP registrar server. And so, so it, logically, it's, it's a bit different. Usually, uh, SIP transports itself over uh, port 5060 UDP, but that's not necessarily the case, of course, like anything else. And it supports also TCP, and you might have support for TLS as well. Um, TLS would be on TCP port 5061. You have uh, basically two types of SIP entities, endpoints, which are usually the phones, SIP phones. And you might have SIP phone adapter, so you would have hook up your normal telephone to, uh, to this adapter, and it would get a SIP presence on the, on the network. And then you have servers. Um, I'll be talking about registrars and proxies. Registrars are um, like a registration server where endpoints can register with, and they usually use authentication, of course, though it's not necessarily the case. And if an endpoint registers, say, extension 100, then any calls, any phone calls for extension 100 should be sent to the IP address and, and port associated with uh, that, and that extension. And then you have proxies. And proxies allow endpoints to reach other um, SIP entities and maybe other PPXs. 
When you have a, an IP PBX, it usually does the job of both the registrar and the proxy server. This is just an introduction for those who are not familiar with the protocol. The, then, I, as I said, um, you have methods, just like HTTP. In HTTP, you have post, get, maybe head options. In SIP, you have invite. Invite gets phones to ring, if done correctly, of course. Um, you have register that I just mentioned. I just mentioned the registrar server. A registrar server would support the register method. And you have options. These are not the only three, of course, but they are the ones that I'll be talking about. Options gives you a list of supported options. So if you want to check um, if a certain endpoint supports certain uh, methods or certain different things, you would send an options message. And this is how it usually looks like. This is a, an invite m message. Um, you can see it looks very similar to HTTP. You have the body. In the case of an invite, you ha would have a body in SDP format, which would describe what codecs are supported, on which port the RTP port is, and so on. Um, you have the to and from address. I'll be talking about, I don't know if you can see that, but in the from address, there's a tag, and I'll be mentioning that later on. And, uh, hello? Okay. And you have a SIP address, SIP URI, in the, uh, instead of the path. In, in HTTP, you will have a path. In this case, you have a SIP URI. So the basic idea when, when it comes to scanning for SIP and, well, UDP devices is to get a response back. Well, traditionally, we were for doing port scanning on UDP, we were sending bl blank packets, um, empty packets, and getting an IC error, ICMP error response. But in this case, this is, this is more reliable because what we do is we send a packet, we send a SIP message, and if we get something back, then we know that there's a SIP, and it makes sense. We know that there's a SIP device there. And it's relatively efficient, I guess. You don't need to use multiple sockets. You don't need to use raw sockets, necessarily. Um, in, in my tools, I, I only use one socket and get all the scanning done like that. And this is the basic idea, uh, the most basic scan, type of scan using an options. You, you would get a, a 200 OK or 404 not found, some sort of response which makes sense when you interpret it as, as a SIP message. And this is one message that I came across. It's not, my tools don't generate this message. It's something that someone else created and it was sent to a friend's honeypot. So this is the basic idea. Um, this is a very basic script. What it does is it creates a, an options message and sends it. And if you get something back, then you know that it works. Um, and this is what I'm talking about. You send lots of zip messages to different IP addresses. Maybe you, you do some randomization, and maybe you do it on different ports, but in my case, I only used 5060. And when you get something back, then you know that th there is a SIP, mess uh, SIP entity in there. So with a ZVMAP, we can do various different ranges, depending on your uh, preference. And we can randomize the scans as well. So you might want to randomize your scan so that you don't hit the same network all the time. And you might want to run a random, random scan as well, which is different. Um, what it does is 
it takes all IP addresses except the ones that are private or um, not allowed on the, inter on the internet, and it scans the whole internet. Um, this is ideal if you're trying to get a sample of what's, what's out there. So we can do random scans, we can do scan by IP address class, we can scan by provider if we want to bother anyone, but we don't want to do that. I decided to go for countries. Um, we can use JIP databases for that. In my case, I was a bit lazy and I decided to, to find a website which does it all for me. Um, all I had to do was specify the country of my choice, Argentina in this case. Pretty easy, right? Save to a text file, change the format so that they become ranges of IP addresses. I used the following options, randomized to random, to have a random scan, input text, um, to input from a, text from a text file. And as you can see, you immediately start getting results. Now, Argentina is actually not one of the most busy SIP hubs, um, but some other countries actually give you much, much better results. So I decided to check out what my own country does, which is a tiny country. Um, there's more people living on the island than there are IP addresses. And I found out that there's a staggering 11.37% of them replying to my SIP messages, which was quite strange because when I checked the other countries, it was huge. Um, I asked some people and it seems that whenever we're giving a, given an IP address range, a new IP address range, they make sure that we actually use it. So, <laughs> so that's, that's why it's such a high percentage. Um, and by looking at these results, I noticed that one particular provider, one of the major ones, was actually exposing uh, it's giving you a, a voice over IP service, and all of these are exposed on the internet, available uh, for scanning, of course. And these are the first, the first ones, actually. The first three are for sure from this provider. And they are cable modem devices, which have, uh, uh, you, you can plug in your normal phone to them and get a, get a line. I also looked at the unpopular ones because sometimes you find some interesting names. Um, however, in this case, I noticed that there's a lot of versions, so I decided that I want to re remove versions from my statistics. And this gives a much more clean overview of what's out there. Asterisk is not as popular as I would have imagined in my country, at least. Um, but yeah, you find Grandstream and so on. And for example, Grandstream had, did have some vulnerabilities and you know, phones will never get patched, or rarely. I also looked at another country, Japan, which seemed a bit mysterious to me. Uh, the numbers are quite different. Unique user agents is much lower. I scanned the first one million IP, address, IP addresses. And most of them did not have uh, a name, did not have a user, because what I was doing is I was looking at the user agent string, in, which is a, one of the headers, just like HTTP headers, user agent or server. If any of these exist, I dump it to a database, 
And in this case, most of them don't have, don't seem to have a user agent. Also interesting is Algida, which I'll be talking about later. And the others, uh, I'm not sure what they are. If someone from the audience knows, um, please let me know later on. I think it's, a, it's some sort of internet provider. Um, but. So what about unknown? Well, when I sent the messages, I noticed that the options message is not is not being allowed, met it not allowed. And this is quite strange because the SIP RFC clearly states you should uh, support options in all SIP devices. And when you start scanning, you find all these different um, non-RFC compliant or different behavior between different devices. But in this case, it tells us what, what it supports. And it supports the very basic uh, phone call functionality, invite, acknowledge, which is required by invite, cancel and buy. Um, it's a very basic SIP phone. Um, what cancel does is it cancels a ringing phone, buy, uh, sends, uh, hangs up the call. What about Algida? Well, Algida, you might, I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar with the Italian ice cream company. It really doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, it's just my user agent. Um, I happened to be looking at an advert when I set my user agent, and I set it as Algida. Uh, the reason why I changed my user agent is because some people from Snort and different intrusion detection systems are actually looking for strings like Subficious or like friendly scanner, which was my old user agent. I didn't want to get any nasty emails during my research, so I kind of changed these, made sure that it doesn't get caught by Snort. It's fine. Yeah, I know. I don't. I didn't get any nasty emails this time. Previously, I did. <laughs> so. Then I decided to look at somewhere near um, Sweden. There's a very small, according to my test, and I ran this scan twice using different IP addresses, of course, using randomization. There's a small number of SIP devices being exposed, but there's a high number of diversity, 200 different user agents, um, almost 80 vendors. So I, I checked out what, what these are. Linksys seems to be relatively popular, but it's still a small number. Um, Asterisk seems to be more popular than the other countries that I checked. And yeah, I mean, you have the usual, the usual user agents then that are associated with uh, service providers. Some interesting ones, some interesting user agents, not from Sweden, but um, all over the world. So you have router to the world. Um, it looks particularly friendly. And one telco, German telco, was actually putting in the user agent string, was actually, or server header, was actually putting different names of different cities. Looks quite interesting. But it's not just about port 5060. Um, you can scan other ports, of course, especially 5061. Um, for example, I have a small Linksys adapter, phone adapter, and it has two different ports. In one port, you can hook up one phone, which would be listening on 5060. The other one is on 5061. Gizmo, um, which is a Skype competitor, and it supports SIP, it does SIP. Um, it's up, it listens on 64064. Of course, you won't find too many Gizmo um, voice over SIP, SIP phones on the internet because they would usually be behind an AT. But there are certain cases where you have an AT devices 
that when you do an open connection, when you open up a connection, they would keep, uh, use a keep alive and the port on some NAT devices would be open all over the, for, for all internet IP address, so it, it wouldn't just filter for the destination IP address, but it would accept. And these seem to be the cheaper ones. Um, and this, this could be quite an issue, I guess. You could also use other methods, other SIP methods. Um, I'll be talking about register later on and invite, which I don't really recommend. And you might have a SRFE records, but it's not so popular, at least not, not on the internet, not on internet exposed uh, PPXs. You might have DNS records which point to your, and the idea is that whenever someone wants to contact your PBX, it would first check the SRV record, the SIP phone or the, the PBX, the third party PBX would check the SRV record and then know where to contact. Well, of course, this information is available for everyone, not for just legitimate users. So what, why was this interesting? Um, of course, market research. Some people might be more interested in that than others. But what we're interested in is security, of course, here. And it's, I think it's a good, it gives you a good idea when someone comes up and says, hey, they, they, there might be a, a voice over IP worm or something like that. It can give you an idea of how to assess how bad the situation is. And as we noticed, um, there's a lot of cable modems out there that are supporting SIP. If you want to look at uh, vulnerabilities in PBXs, you'll notice that there's much less PBXs being exposed. There's more asterisk than the competition, at least when it comes to SIP. Um, and for example, one particular vulnerability, um, SIP digest leakage, I won't be describing it that much over here, but basically this affects a lot of SIP end endpoints. It's, it seems to be a vulnerability in the SIP RFC, so it's a built-in by, de by design security issue. And according to my tests um, in a lab environment, of course, um, it affects around 60% of the SIP endpoints. Um, if you want to find me later on, we can discuss this security issue. <coughs> And it affects endpoints, so we can get an idea of how widespread this vulnerability is. But there, there's quite a few user, uh, there's quite a few SIP devices that don't tell you who they are. They try to keep, keep it secret. Well, one solution would be fingerprinting. Um, the other solution would be getting it by force, of course. But I tried to go to the fingerprinting technical solutions. Uh, in this case, you can notice that um, you'll notice a lot of asterisk servers which have the user agent which would have been modified during compilation or something like that. So if you modify that, there's quite an obvious giveaway. The two tag is when you send us an options message, you get a response back and the two tag in the header, um, it's set by the responder. And everyone seems to be generating this in a different manner. So there's no standard way of generating this and everyone is including their own um, fingerprint, I guess. So the, in the case of asterisk, it always starts with AS and it's followed by five or six hexadecimal numbers. And yeah, these, these are some of the fingerprints. If you download SIPVicious, you'll find more in the databases. Um, SIPVicious is open source. And that's not necessarily reliable. Some devices don't create a two tag. Sometimes they should, but they don't. 
So I decided to take it further and look at other methods. Um, the order of headers is particularly interesting. In this case, you'll notice that these two messages have the same order. Both are asterisk messages. So I, if I put them beside each other, you'll notice that it's contact and supported are swapped, but the rest have the same order. Um, in this case, the call ID header and the CSEC are inverted. Um, so it's the second message is not an asterisk message, it's, it's something else. Um, and that's one way to tell between one, ser one SIP entity and another. And it usually shows you the SIP stack rather than the device name, of course. So you might have the same SIP stack on different devices, different products. And you also have, um, you can look at the case. So in this case, um, the case of the call ID in the first place, it's uppercase, the ID. In the second case, it's not. And you have all these differences, which are quite um, useful when you're trying to fingerprint. Um, so the nice thing about this is that it's pretty passive. You can do it passively, or you can just use one packet to elicit a response and, and then look at this single packet. When you're trying to do fingerprinting, once you have the whole database and all the work done. And yeah, Subvicious, this was introduced in an old version of Subvicious. Um, I included a weight so that people can submit their, their fingerprints. And it does automatic uh, regular expression generation. It's not uh, the best algorithm, I guess, but it kind of works. However, in Subvicious 2.0, which is being rewritten, um, I hope to improve this a lot because the fingerprinting is quite not so reliable right now. So in Subvicious 2.0, I actually wrote a parser, a SIP parser, which actually works unlike the version 0. whatever 2. And that's, that's it about fingerprinting. So let's talk about some strange stuff. Um, well, same, same here. Uh, a register scan, you would send lots of register messages. If some reply, they would usually ask for authentication or tell you, hey, you're not authorized to get, um, to get this information back, to get registered. Um, you might get a 404 not found or something like that. But when you do get a 200 OK, it usually means that it's not OK. Um, by 200 OK, when, it means that you got registered. Uh, it means that your scanner was registered to the PBX and, or, or SIP entity. Um, and w what happened in this case? Um, I found a couple of devices which were replying with 200 OK. And later on, during the week, I, start, I was checking out, I was sniffing my connection for SIP. And I was noticing lots of traffic coming in my way, uh, which was not supposed to be destined to my IP address. Um, what was happening was I was getting all the scanning going on on the internet from certain IP addresses, which had actually registered with my scanner. And this meant that, for, for me, this meant that I got a, a better honeypot. Um, I could get more SIP messages. But of course, um, I wonder what happened to the, to the people trying to use their, uh, their endpoints, of course. And it's, it can create problems, for sure. So I won't do that again. What about invite scans? Well, I'm not doing any invite scans at all. Um, invite gets phones to ring. Um, in the case of P a PBX, it might try to proxy the invite, so it might try to terminate the phone call. 
however, many t most of the times um, when you try to ring a SIP, uh, a SIP entity, a SIP endpoint, it requires you to ring it on a specific SIP URI. Say if it's usually registered to extension 123 on the PBX, if you don't call it on 123, if you send it a, an invite message uh, which doesn't include that extension, um, it wouldn't ring. It would tell you, hey, 404 or some other messi message. But the problem is that some phones will actually ring on an extension. And just ringing on a specific extension is not even a security precaution, really. But ringing on any extension is quite a problem. I noticed that a lot of software-based SIP phones do this. Um, a lot of hardware-based SIP phones don't have this behavior, but some do. So if you're doing these kind of scans, you might end up um, calling a whole provider and you might end up with lots of complaints. Don't do it. Um, in the case of a PBX, the behavior is somewhat different. A PBX will try to find if that extension exists on the network. If that phone exists on the network, it will call it sometimes. Not necessarily the case. There, there are many times where it asks for credentials for authentication. However, if that extension does not exist and if it matches with certain, um, with certain patterns, if it looks like a phone number, it might try to route it and it might try to call a phone number on the normal phone system, which might give you freak phone calls and that's what someone tried to do, well, more than someone. Uh, quite a few people seem to be trying to do this. One guy actually um, wrote a paper after one particular scan, which was on a German provider. Lots of people were getting these weird, funny-looking locks in their CDR, in their call, record, call records. So this guy decided to investigate. This is the SIP message that they were sending. It's not exactly RFC compliant, but it seems that it still works. Um, he was faking the user agent, of course, telling everyone that it's Xlite, the well-known software phone. But this, some, this someone was actually searching for phones and, and trying to uh, find ways of getting free phone calls. So after reading this, this paper, which was talking about what, what I just described over here, I decided to write some basic, very basic code, a fake PBX, um, just a few lines of code. Um, and I named it Voimkhan. So I put it on the internet and started talking to database, whatever I was going, getting. Um, it's very basic, so you can look at the, at the code. Configuration is still part of the code, but I'll be shifting that to an inner file probably. Um, the first extension doesn't have any password. This is some Python code. Um, the second extension has password 101, ter third extension woohoo, and so on. Yeah, you'll, you'll notice how it works with Xlite, with a normal software phone. So in the first case, we don't have any password, so it just gives you an OK. And the software phone thinks it's registered to a real PBX. Second case, I'll give it a wrong password. So it gives you a 401 authorization required. Um, so the phone knows that um, 
the bad, it was a bad password, you need to give it a good password. Which I did. It registers. And finally, I gave it a, a non-existent extension, and it replies with a 404. So we're gonna see that. So then I, I obviously wanted to make sure that it works with at least subvicious. I don't have any of the other tools which are not released. Um, th there are some tools uh, which are being used by the underground um, custom tools for scanning. So I could make sure that it works with subvicious and it, it does. The, uh, the extension enumeration technique is implemented in as VWAR. So what it does is it um, checks if uh, an extension replies um, with an, it, it shows that it's, it exists on the PPX or not. And then finally, SVCrack, which does the cracking uh, using brute force attack and that works. So, okay, so I put this on the internet and started getting, eventually started getting some interesting messages. I needed to do a lot of filtering in my data because um, some people were scanning with SVWAR which generates, and SVCREC which generates a lot of traffic. But once I got the filtering out of the way, I started noticing one of the first messages that I started noticing was this message, an invite um, destined to a, I think, South American number, and claiming to come from Meiuchi Solutions. I didn't know about this company before. Um, and I got more messages different numbers, trying to get uh, some, some phones to ring maybe, trying to get a line, trying to route their calls. And you'll notice that they start changing the prefix so that they add zero, zero, for example, in a lot of PBXs, you just add zero to get an outside line. So I checked out who are these major solutions, and they seem to be some guys who are who are interested in voice over IP security, in fact, um, and who are doing some testing when it comes to voice over IP, but they have a complaints page, and they are actually saying, hey, there's someone who is setting the user agents and the, uh, the call ID, uh, the caller ID, as Meiuchi Solutions, it's not us. I sent them an email last week, to see what they say, include an, another slide, but didn't get anything from them. Uh, it's interesting that someone is, is uh, spoofing uh, an actual company, if they are. What else? Uh, th this message, I started getting this message, even one, this is very similar to the same message that, uh, that was described in that paper by Klaus, the paper that I described before. I think this was mo one month later, so these guys were still scanning even and didn't really change their software, unlike, unlike me, um, even after a paper was written about them. And they started changing the prefix as well, putting zeros and putting 9011, so they, they try to enumerate the prefix and send lots of invite messages, try to get an outside line. So what's the purpose behind this? Well, obviously, there's, there's profit involved um, in voice over IP fraud. Uh, phone fraud has been done for quite a while. You have the phone freaks and so on, lots of nice stories. 
some of them in the movies. Um, but phone calls obviously cost money. Uh, phone, phone call termination costs a lot of money. So one scheme seems to be um, cyber criminals try to find some PBXs with either weak passwords or, as we saw, try to simply route their uh, phone calls, um, try to find a way to route their phone calls. And what they do is they, they would configure their PBX, their asterisk server, um, to use these different weak, uh, vulnerable um, PBXs on the internet. And then they would sell access to their asterisk server to third parties, to VoIP providers, who would find their, their, these services cheaper, of course. And there were some people who were caught doing this previously, so it's not just my idea. Um, there's a lot of guys who were not caught, or they're just keeping low or relatively low. Um, I've heard of million dollars of losses, not only on the news, but also from talking to people. Um, one particular bank was claiming that they lost a lot of money. Um, because of toll fraud, because of a vulnerable PBX on the internet. The problem is that sometimes you have to put your PBX on the internet to communicate. I mean, it's, it's easier. Not, it's not necessary. Um, it's better to put it behind a VPN or something like that, of course. Um, apart from that, you might have premium number fraud, um, which can, can easily move towards voice over IP. And denial of service might be a huge problem. Um, in the case of a call center, for example, it means that uh, all, all, uh, all the employees can go to home if the PBX doesn't work anymore. So if you have a call center, try not to expose your PBX on the internet, at least. It's the first step. Um, I've noticed that, for example, Microsoft, their solution uh, which supports SIP over TLS, um, uses the Windows credentials. So when you, do, when you do authentication, if you do a brute force attack, you might have a lockout policy. So you can lock out a whole Active Directory domain, I guess. Um, I never actually tried this. <laughs> so yeah, for, for this talk, I, this, I updated SIP Vicious to support my statistics uh, scanning. Um, first, the, it is a new option, scans the first X number of IP addresses. Input text is very handy because uh, sometimes you don't want to type all the IP addresses by hand, um, so you put them on a text file, I guess. Debug was handy um, when I didn't have my sniffer on. Um, SV report stats, which gives you the top, top 30 and top 30 unpopular devices as well, and, and does some filtering, as I described before. To update your version of SIP Vicious, just run SV and update some references. That's all. Uh, I'd like to thank the SACT team for the invitation. It was great. Thanks. Absolutely, thank you for coming. Uh, I've, I've just got a few questions. I mean, first of all, the last thing with the honey pie, um, could you like answer one of the calls? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll add that feature. You just make me curious. I mean, the other thing, make one of those calls, uh -huh. see where it goes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm, I mean to add that feature. Till now, I, I don't have call answering features, it right. just replies, um, okay. I just want to curious to see what's on but the other I need, I need, yeah, I need to start listening on the RTP stream on the media mm -hmm. and start recording. <laughs> and make a, make a database list of all the numbers that are being, try yeah. that they're, they're trying to buy. Well, I can do that, I can do that. Um, I noticed South American ones, but you don't really need to terminate the phone call in the sense that you don't need to be listening, as a scanner, you don't need to be at the other end because 
once you start getting uh, you know the normal beep mm -hmm. of the phone it starts sending an RT uh, the RTP stream and the attacker would know that hey we have free phone calls mm -hmm. and then then it would decide to probably call its own number exactly so just let it yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> and uh, also, when you're doing those scans, I mean, wouldn't it be fun to have like a central database for all these things? I mean, for people to submit what they find. I mean, I want to see statistics. <laughs> I don't. I want to see statistic more more than I will, you know more than a million IP addresses of a country. Yeah, yeah. It's it's quite. It's, it's just an idea. Com combine it all together. It's an idea. Um, could you say something about the digest leakage thing? I mean, not how it sure. works, but maybe how it's useful. I mean, what, what it can be used for, what you've seen exploited. Okay, okay. So the digest leakage vulnerability, um, what it does is you have, it, it works on SIP endpoints, like mm -hmm. so SIP phones. Um, if you call a SIP phone, sometimes you have to guess what the extension is, but that's not necessarily a problem if it's a targeted attack. If you call a SIP phone, it answers, someone answers, picks up the phone, or maybe you have automated voicemail or something. And when he answers, he doesn't hear anything, so they hang up from their end. Mm -hmm. Once they hang up, they send you a buy, and you challenge that buy. You tell it, hey, you're not authorized to send me a buy. Give me your, your credentials. It does a challenge response, and then you can do an offline brute force attack, which is quite fast. Um, it's SIP digest authentication, so it's like the HTTP digest authentication. It's MD5, three times MD5, but it's still MD5, and it's quite fast to brute force such, such hashes. All right, cool. It's always fun to see a, a word dialer again. <laughs> yeah. And so on. Um, There's um, Warbox. So, so you're rewriting this suspicious yeah. thing. So you're putting in more fun features? Um, more protocols. Yeah. So I have IAX2, um, which is already part of Wipeback, but I'll be including this in my, my open source stuff as well. Uh, I hope to cover Cisco really mm -hmm. badly because Cisco, I mean, everyone is using Cisco, at least in their internet uh, voice over IP structures. Uh, apart from the protocols, um, I'll probably be testing for these, these, similar to what we saw in these scans. I'll be exploring that area more, so in more invite stuff, but I have to be really, um, I don't know if I will include that in Subvicious, because the problem with having an open source tool is um, everyone uses it, right? So the good guys and the bad guys. And I already had quite a few complaints due to SV war being quite noisy. So if it, um, I include some tool which is noisy, I want to make sure that it's not as easy to use. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not as plug and play and, and yeah. And subficious tends to be quite easy to use. All right. But you're getting like abuse mails. Yeah, from time to time. All right. right now, not that much. But whenever I do an update, all right, make, it, make sure it's easy to set your own uh, user agent name. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. But there's still fingerprinting, yeah. ways to fingerprint it. Absolutely. 